Amen. All right. So uh, Judges chapter 9 is the topic this morning. We're or not this morning, this evening. We're going to get through um, not quite half of it. Um, this evening, we're going to talk about um, the beginning half or you know, not quite half of Judges chapter 9. So where, where are we at here? So Judges chapter 9 starts after the death of of Gideon. So we talked about for the last three chapters, um, the Judge Gideon. The Judge Gideon freed the Israelites from the Midianites and much more than the Midianites, he defeated the army of the Midianites and all of their um, conglomerate people from the east, the Bible calls it. So Gideon um, was a great judge and he freed um, the people and some great uh, victories that God granted through Gideon. Gideon is now dead and of course if you look back at Judges chapter 8 and look at the verse um, just the last verse of Judges chapter 8 and look at the last two verses and the Bible says and the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubal namely Gideon according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. So look, as soon as Gideon was dead, the verse right before that says, you know, Gideon died and then these things happened. So basically, Gideon defeats the Midianites, frees the children of Israel, and they have 40 years of peace. But as soon as Gideon dies, they just turn away immediately. Okay? And we'll see how immediate it was in Judges chapter 9. Right away, let's just get right into it. Um, Israel turns away again. And look at what the Bible says in Judges chapter 9 and verse number 1. And Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel went to Shechem unto his mother's... I'm going to change the way I pronounced it to match Brother Ryan's pr pronunciation so I don't confuse anybody. <laughs> so we're going to call it uh, Shechem unto his mother's bre brethren and commune with them and with all the family of the house of his mother saying, mother's father saying, speak I pray you in the ears of all the men of Shechem whether it is better for you either that the sons of Jerubbabel, which are three score and ten persons, that seventy sons reign over you or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. So who is Abimelech. First of all, go back to Judges chapter 8 and verse number 31. The Bible says, look at verse number 30, and Gideon had threescore and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. Of course, in verse number 30, it says that he had threescore and ten. A score is 20, so three times 20 plus 10 is 70 sons. In Jerubal had 70 sons with his many wives, the Bible says. And then in verse 31, it says, and his concubine, which is basically one of, a, it's a lesser form of a wife, a maidservant who um, is in the role of a wife. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. So this is the man, he's kind of, he's, he's not really from one of his wives, he's, he's from a, a concubine, and he lives in a different part. He's separated from uh, the, um, from the other 70 brothers. So that is who Abimelech is. He's the son of this concubine. Okay, and in Judges chapter 9, verses number 1 and number 2, he's basically trying to convince, you know, these people of Shechem to let him be in charge or put him in charge of them. He's saying, look, would you rather have 70 people rule over you or just me? Just, you know, He's basically pining for the job to be in charge. So Shechem is in Manasseh. That's where Gideon is from on the west side of Jordan. Of course, Manasseh was on both sides of the Jordan, if you remember. It was a tribe that was cut in half. One side was on the east. One side was on the west. But Shechem is in Manasseh. It's a city on the west side of Jordan. So look at verse number three. So this is who Abimelech is, and this is what he's doing. He's trying to uh, gain power over, you know, his, um, his father's people that he was ruling over or being a judge over. In Judges chapter 9, look at verse 3. And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem. So he's trying to basically be, you know, a king over this city is what he's trying to do. All these words and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, he is our brother. They're like, well, okay, he's from the same city as us. He's basically, he's Gideon's son. He's from our town. You know, let's, uh, you know, they, he convinced them. And they gave him threescore and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Balbareth, where, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. So look, they give him, it's interesting that they give him the exact amount of money that is the same amount as, as, you know, Gideon's sons are. So basically what they did was they paid, you know, him money to have Gideon's sons killed. 
Okay, so this is, this is basically blood money that they gave to him, and he hires these vain and light persons to follow him. He basically hires a mercenary army to go and kill Gideon's... I mean, look, vain and light persons means that these are not men of principle. Okay, that they can be bought, they can be paid for. They're the kind of people where you could go up and pay them money and say, hey, I need to have you kill somebody for me. And they would be like, okay, that's a vain and light person. Okay, now look, this is, you know, typical of insurrections in the Bible. I mean, we could go into this, but basically, you know, Absalom did something similar. He took, you know, he, he, he found 50 men to run before him. Okay, and, you know, uh, Adonijah, you know, another one of David's sons did the same thing. He had 50 men to run before him to show his importance and to just, look, these, these guys before their insurrections, look, before you take over, before you have an insurrection, you have to get rid of the opposition and you also need to look the part. Okay, so that's why Absalom and Adonijah, you know, hired those, if they hired them or, or got those 50 people to run in front of them so they could look the part and, you know, people would think that they're the king, okay? But in this particular case, you know, this money was paid to um, Adonijah, not Adonijah, Abimelech, to kill the sons of Gideon, okay? I mean, talk about forgetting, you know, what Gideon has done for you. I mean, th these are basically men that will do what they're told for money, okay? Look at verse number five. And he went unto his father's house at Ophrah, and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubbabel, being threescore and ten persons, upon one stone. So they basically take these 70 men with this mercenary army and they kill them. They execute them all in the same place. Notwithstanding, yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left. So they only killed 69 of them and one of them got away. Okay, for he hid himself. All right, and the men of Shechem... Shechem gathered together in all the house of Milo and went and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. So they make him king uh, of this, you know, of of this town or of, of Shechem, right? So now, I mean, you can ask yourself, is this the first king of Israel? I mean, they made, you know, they made Abimelech king here, but here's the thing. So this is, first of all, this is the tribe of Manasseh, and it's a city inside Manasseh. There's no indication that he was king over Israel at all. And of course, he was not chosen by God. He just basically paid a bunch of people to kill some people and pretend that he's king. Okay, so no, he's not um, the first king of Israel. But one thing that we can see so far is if you go back to um, Judges chapter 8 and look at verse number 22... You already see, we already see in the book of Judges just this innate desire of the people to have a king. Okay, now that'll, that, that, you know, that's important as we move forward in the history of the Bible. But look at verse 22 of uh, chapter 8, Judges chapter 8. The men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. So basically, you have a situation where even when Gideon you know, won the battle against um, the Midianites, they asked him to be king. They're like, hey, rule over us. And, and we know that they asked him to be king because they said, hey, rule over us and your son and his son. They're basically asking him and his family to be the dynasty, to be that royalty that will rule over the nation of Israel. But Gideon, of course, said no. You know, but that just shows that there is just this innate desire that is, that is coming out of the children of Israel for an earthly king, okay? Gideon, of course, said, no, the Lord shall rule over you. And that's why, of course, when they asked for an earthly king, that God said, you know, they didn't reject you, Samuel. You know, they rejected me because they rejected God's leadership to ask for an earthly king. Look at verse number 7 of Judges chapter 9. Now this is Jotham, and this is going to be the main focus of the, ser the, the sermon this evening. This is Jotham. He escapes. He's the son of Gideon. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. These trees, now he gives a parable. He gives a parable that is really what we're going to call the curse of Jotham. Okay, so he is giving um, this parable that is really a curse upon Abimelech. And it starts in verse number 8. The Bible says, The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness? Wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees. 
And the tree said unto the fig tree. So basically the olive tree said, I, I don't want the job. He said, I don't, I don't want the job. Things are going good for me. You know, I, I don't want the job. And the tree said, so they go to the fig tree. Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? So again, the fig tree says a similar thing. Then said the trees unto the vine, come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, should I leave my vine, which cheereth God and man to go be promoted over the trees? So, you know, the, the olive tree, the fig tree, and the vine are like, we're good. You know, things are pretty good for us. You know, we don't need to be in charge over the trees. You know, we got our grapes and, you know, our figs and, you know, the fatness of the olives is like, we're good. No thanks, right? And then said all the trees unto the bramble, verse 14, come thou, reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, if in truth he anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So, of course, you have a, quite a contrast here in verse number 15, where you have the bramble. What's a bramble? It's a weed. A bramble is a, is a thorny bush that's worth nothing. Okay, it's not, it's not a great tree. So you have this contrast in verse 15 of this bramble ruling over what? I mean, the cedars of Lebanon. So the, the trees that are asking to be ruled over are the cedars of Lebanon. Now go look at the cedars of Lebanon in the Bible. And those are the, the greatest trees they were sought after. They were the trees that were used to, by Hiram to build the temple of Solomon. I mean, they're, they're, they're up on the top of the food chain as far as trees go in the Bible. Look at verse 16. Now therefore, if you have done truly and sincerely, and that you have made Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jerubbabel and his house, and you have done unto him according to, to the deserving of his hands, and in verse 17 we have a you know, parenthesis here that says, For my father fought for you, and adventured his life far, and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. And ye have risen up against my father's house this day, and have slain his sons, threescore and ten persons, upon one stone, and have made Abimelech the son of his maidservant king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. And if ye have dealt truly and sincerely with Jerubbabel and his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. So he said, if you've done the right thing, then enjoy your king and let him enjoy you and live in peace. And he's saying this, but look, he knows that, and they know that they haven't done the right thing. And then in verse 20, he says, but if not, let fire come out of Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. So Jotham essentially curses the men of Shechem against Abimelech, and he curses Abimelech against the men of Shechem. Essentially saying to them, you know what? You deserve each other, is what he's saying. Okay, now look at verse 21. That's as far as we're going to get um, this evening. And then I want to go back and I want to talk about the curse of Jotham. But look at verse 21. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. So look, we're going to talk about, you know, what happens after the curse and how the curse comes true in the last half or the second half of this sermon. But look, the bottom line is I want to look at Jotham's curse this evening. And I want to talk about how Jotham's curse can show us how we can recognize a good leader and a bad leader in our lives. And what God and what God is telling us with Jotham's curse on the type of leaders that we should be. Because everyone here, in some way, shape, or form, is or is going to be a leader in their life. So look, let's look back at Jotham's curse and kind of cut this thing up a little bit and see what he's actually saying. So look, Jotham is talking about trees, and he's talking about vines, and he goes through Basically, he goes through four different examples here. The first examples are good examples. Okay, he asked, the people first asked the olive tree to rule over them. The olive answer is this. It says, should I leave my fatness, wherewith by they honor, they honor God and man? Then he asks the fig tree. He says, you know, rule over us to the fig tree. The trees ask the fig tree to rule over them. And he says, should I forsake my sweetness? He says. And then, of course, they asked, the trees asked the vine. 
And he says, should I leave my wine with cheereth God and man? So look, these are all good trees. These are all trees that produce something good. That's the first thing. Now I could go into, and I've heard a lot of sermons about, you know, just comparing the different things about an, the olive tree symbolizes this, and, you know, the vine symbolizes this, and the fig, you know, tree symbolizes this, and I'm not, you know, downplaying any of those, but I don't want to miss, basically, the overall point of this curse or this parable this evening. So what I want to talk to you about is basically what this parable is talking about is it's trying to get you to think, and it's trying to get these people to think. I mean, really, it's a curse, but it should get us to think who we want leading us is what this curse, this parable, is talking about. Look, this is who you want leading you, is this olive tree and this fig tree and the vine. That's the point of this parable. But most times, as Jotham points out, he will not want the job is the interesting thing about it. Look, the olive trees throughout history that have taken the job did not want it. The good trees, the good leaders, they were put in roles, they took those roles, but they didn't really want those roles. They did it out of sense of service. Because, you know, they were already in a situation where things were good for them. Why would they want to do that? Maybe they were already wealthy. Maybe it was something like that. Maybe they had everything going for them. Just like these three trees are saying. He's like, look, things are good for us. You know, no thanks. But look, that is what made these trees good. And that is uh, an example, something that we can look for as far as a leader that is going to be a good leader over us. Right? Look, there's many examples of this in the Bible as well. There's many examples of this. Good men, good men, good trees that didn't necessarily want the job. Uh, Moses? He's like, I am not eloquent. Moses said, you know, I can't even speak. He's basically said to God, God wants him to be a spokesperson and go free, you know, the, 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 the children of Israel from the Egyptians, from Pharaoh. He's like, I, I can't speak. So he provides him Aaron. But look, he goes. He goes out of service and out of, you know, reverence to God. Jeremiah didn't want the job. Jeremiah didn't want the job. Jonah, Jonah literally ran away. Jonah tried to run away from God. But then you look at what these, and there's many more examples in the Bible, but you look at what these men ended up doing, they did great things out of service for the Lord. There's many examples of this in early American history of, you know, olive trees, you know, taking the job of leadership out of, out of service. You know, there's not that many today. You know, I can't give you that many today. Everybody, you know, everybody wants the job today. So look, look at, go back to um, Judges chapter 8 and verse number 22. Look, here, here's the thing. Gideon was the olive tree. Gideon was the olive tree here. Look at Judges chapter 8 and verse number, look at, Verse 23 of Judges 8, they asked him to be king. They said, hey, rule over us. Have your sons and your sons' sons rule over us. What does Gideon say? He said to them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So Gideon basically just said, you know, God's going to be, you know, Gideon didn't want the job. And it didn't say, you know, he didn't want the job because he, you know, he wanted to be wealthy, but he just didn't want the job. It was God's job, and he knew that. Okay, so he didn't want the job. But then you go to Judges chapter 9 and verse number 2, and look what you see. You see, in verse number 2, he says, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you, either that the sons of Jerubbabel, which are threescore and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and flesh. So here you have this guy. It's kind of the opposite of the olive tree, which is Abimelech. He's out, he's out wanting the job. He's out scheming to get the job to be king that Gideon didn't want, that Gideon refused because the Lord was in charge. So look, the olive tree, the fig tree, the vine, they were good. They were good trees. They produced good fruit. They didn't want the job. They're like, you know, why would we want that job? But then you have this other tree, this other plant, if you want to call it, the bramble. And the bramble is the weed. It's the thorny brush. And it wants the job. And it's out pining for the job. Now look, this is who you don't want in charge is this guy. You don't want the bramble in charge. Look, this is the guy 
who wants the role. It's a promotion for him. I mean, look, he's never really gotten anywhere. He's a weed. He's never really gotten anywhere. He's never really done anything. He's never really had anyone that wanted to follow him, yet he just wants the job so badly he just can't wait to get it. He's pining for the job. He wants to just rule over the cedars of Lebanon. Oh, if I could only get that job to rule over those cedars of Lebanon. Where, look, typically people would just cut him down as a nuisance. People have probably been cutting him down his whole life as a nuisance. But he just wants to be in charge. He just wants to be in charge of people. This is the guy that wants power for the sake of being in power. Why? Turn to Mark chapter 9. Why? Why would someone want power for the sake of being in power? Look, this is the guy. Look, everybody, look, everybody wants to be the boss, right? Everybody wants to be the boss. Why? So they can have things their way. Everybody wants to be the boss, so everyone has to do what I say. That's the wrong kind of boss, I'm telling you right now. And that's what this parable is teaching us. Look at Mark chapter 9 and verse number 35. Why, why is that? Because if you want to be the boss just so you can be the boss, just so you can get your way, it doesn't work. Why? Because the Bible, it's, it's outside the model. It's not the model of leadership. Look at Mark 9, 35. And he sat down and he called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. So look, that is the opposite of Bramble leadership philosophy right there. Look at Judges chapter 9 and verse 15. Look at Judges chapter 9 and verse number 15. So this guy is this Bramble. You know, he wants the job. He's pining for the job. He wants to be in charge for the sake of being in charge, to get his way, to just, you know, have, you know, the preeminence over people. But look at Judges 9.15. And the bramble said unto the trees, this is the opposite of Mark 9.35, and the bramble said unto the trees, if in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now look, this is very... You better listen to this verse. Because he's saying, look, if you want me in charge, he's like, you know, he wants people in his shadow, and he's going to rule, you know, with fire, the Bible says. It's not good. This guy wants the job to have preeminence over people. It's not going to work. It's outside the biblical model. It's anti-Bible in so many ways. Look at, turn to 3 John chapter 1. 3 John verse number 9. 3 John verse number 9. The problem is, is that the Bible teaches that leadership, you know, if you want to be in charge for the sake of being in charge, you probably shouldn't read much in the Bible about what it says about leadership. Because it says leadership is servitude. It says leadership is, you know, putting others in front of yourself. It's not about the preeminence at all, is what the Bible says. Look at 3 John, verse number 9. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who love to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. So look, the preeminence, what, what does that mean? It means you have a, basically you have a superiority complex. You think in your mind that, I mean, look, this is a, this is a bramble right here. Somebody that thinks in their mind that they're, they're superior to everybody, but for some reason no one's ever put them in charge. So they're always pining for that job to be in charge. Put me in charge. I should be in charge. They're the ones trying to climb the ladder. You know, it worked. They're just kicking people out of the way to try to get up that ladder, no matter what. Right? But look, here's the thing. Let's do, here's the thing. This applies, this applies to ordained leadership as well. You say, are you talking about pastors? No. I'm talking about ordained leadership. I'm talking about leadership that, you know, you will find yourself in, according to the Bible, in your life. So let's do, let's do a thought experiment. What's a thought experiment? A thought experiment is something that I can just give you a scenario, and we can all think through this scenario together. And look, thought experience is the great thing about them. You can do thought experience, ex experiments. You don't have to build anything. You don't have to do anything. You can just think through something, 
and see if it comes to a logically good conclusion or not, and then decide if you want to build something. So first do a thought experiment. So let's do that. Let's talk about, you know, parents. I mean, that's an ordained leadership role. Let's talk about husbands, fathers. That's an ordained leadership role. You're like, I don't really want to be a leader. I don't need to be a leader. Well, guess what? You get married and have kids, you're a leader now. You're a leader. You're a leader over your wife. You're a leader over your children. That's an ordained leadership role. So what kind of leader do you want to be? So let's talk about if you're the kind of person that, that wants to lead like the bramble in your ordained leadership role. You're like, yes, I'm a parent now. I mean, these kids have to do what I say. I mean, that's true. Okay? But look, you want the power just, just to get your way, you know, to put people in your shadow. And, but, look, but look, this is the kind of person you are. You want the power just for the sake of having the power. You're now a parent. You're now a father. You're now a husband. You want the power just to have the preeminence over people. Now you have a family. You have the preeminence. It's ordained to you. You now have that preeminence. You have that superiority. You have that leadership role. Luckily, no one at work has ever put you in charge of anything because they, they've avoided this. They're like, this guy's a bramble. They've avoided this in you, and people in the world have recognized this and avoided your leadership, but now you're in charge of a family, and you have that ordained leadership role. So you rule over people in the shadows. You threaten with fire. That's the bramble. It's, and I, I'm ta look, I'm talking about as your kids get older here, folks. A lot of young kids in, in the church, but as your kids get older, you know, you're this bramble. You're a my way or the highway type of leader. You know, as your kids get older, you think about this, Dad. What type, think about this, as you rule, as you rule people in the shadows and threaten them with fire, let me ask you, what kind of people are you training your sons to be? What kind of people are you training your children to be? Are you training men that will cower in the shadows? That's what, are you training a bunch of submissive beta males with no ability to lead anything? Is that what you're training? I told, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to out uh, Garrett on something here. I asked his, his permission to tell this story, but it's interesting. I had a story um, the, other, the other day, like two days ago, at the dinner table, we were talking about something at the dinner table. And I can't remember, it was like a political work type situation, and he was telling me about this work situation, and it, it had some political people ramifications to it, and we were kind of going back and forth on this issue, and he had a different opinion than, than I did. And, and, I, and I just I said to him, I said, well, you know, here, here's what I think, and just, just think about that. He's like, yeah, but I, I, I think um, this, and you know, I might uh, do this, and, and whatever. But look, when, he, when we got up from the table, you know what I told him? I said, you know what? I, I'm glad that you're thinking and having your own op opinions on things. But I'm not talking about Bible doctrine. I'm not talking about major things. But look, we didn't actually see eye to eye on this exact situation. And he'll eventually realize that I was right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But, but the point is, it's nice to see that he's got a couple different thoughts on things that I might have a chance of raising an independent man. Amen. A chance. It shows that you could be raising an independent person. Because guess what? He's going to need to be, and your kids are going to need to be prepared for leadership one day. They're going to need that. I mean... Won't your children have to lead? Do you ever want grandkids? We're in the thought experiment now. Think about it. You ever want grandkids? Your sons will lead families. Your daughters will lead children. And your children will need to step out of the shadows at some point. I mean, think about it. I mean, think about... Look, it's not about crushing people into the shadows and threatening with fire. If you lead as a... Look, if you turn to Ephesians chapter 6. If you lead, we're still in the thought experiment here. If you lead as a bramble, one of two things will happen. Guaranteed. 
If you lead your family, if you're in an ordained leadership role, ladies listen up too, if you lead as a bramble, one of two things will happen. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 4. The first thing is this. Here's the first thing that could happen. There's only, there's only two things that will happen here. It's one of two things. The first one is this. The first option is that you will provoke your children to wrath. The Bible says in Ephesians uh, 6, 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but, look at this, but, this is the opposite of the bramble here. You, I mean, you think it's a coincidence that this stuff just kind of fits together perfectly throughout the entire Bible? Look what it says. It says, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Look, now here's the thing. You could provoke your children to wrath if you lead like the bramble, but I think, I think that that's probably the best option that could happen. When you think about these two options that could possibly happen if you lead by shoving people into the shadows and threatening with fire, I think the best thing that could happen is that you, know, you provoke them to wrath. Because the other choice is this. You will raise a submissive child that is only comfortable in the shadows. Ooh. That's serious. You ever met one of these people? I meet these people all the time. I mean, you ever heard of the kid that will never leave home? You ever heard of the kid that can never handle anything? You ever heard of the kid who, who can't hold a job? You ever heard of the kid? Look, look folks, you have to get this right with your kids. You have to get this right with your kids because once they're adults, it's very hard to fix. You have to get this right. You can't lead like a bramble and end up with children that can't handle anything. I mean, that you'll, you'll, end, you'll, end up, you'll end up with these children that are these submissive shadow dwellers that are just getting burned by brambles their entire life if you raise your children and lead like the bramble it's it's ugly and and i don't know i don't know if there's i mean with god anything's possible but it's it's a hard thing to fix so look just in conclusion let me tell you something about the world okay the world is full of brambles that's the problem that's the problem if you raise a child with no strength that you've crushed into the shadows and threatened with fire. The world's full of brambles. And the world is just going to burn them to their knees again and again and again. Look, I mean, this world is a tough place. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not easy out there. It will beat you down. And, and as you raise these kids in your shadows threatening them with fire, here's what you will do. You will destroy your legacy. You'll destroy your legacy. You know that, that proper secession? That proper secession that we talk about so much? You know that, that, that adherence to God's word from generation to generation? What are we talking about in Judges? Are you getting sick of of in Judges, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. The children of Israel again, 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 again. Gideon, by all intents and purposes, one of the best judges, one of the, the greatest judges. There's three whole chapters in the Bible about him. He destroys this huge army. God takes him and just wins this huge victory for, you know, through Gideon. I mean, they wanted him to be king. I mean, they're just like, rule over us. And what, his kids couldn't even have that. They couldn't even have that secession go from even Gideon to the next generation. You think you got this thing figured out? <laughs> you think this is easy? Look at Jotham's curse. If you lead like the bramble, you will, you will produce, you will destroy that secession. It's, only, it's one way to do it. There's lots of ways how to do it. But this is one way. Look, this is, it's, it's something, look, this, this proper secession, how, how, do I, how do I live my life 
as a Bible-believing Christian and serve the Lord in my life? Look, it's hard enough, right? How many people are in here? Are there a thousand people in here? How do I live my life as a Christian and live my life according to how God wants me to live my life? And, and go soul winning and serve the Lord and do what I'm supposed to do and come to church and, and just serve in, in all the ways and just, just have a pleasing life towards the Lord. How do I do that? That's tough. But hey, oh, I figured it out. Now, how do I pass that on to my kids? Everybody fails at that. Why? Because it's hard. Because it's a rough world and it's full of brambles out there. I mean, it, the, uh, the majority of the problem is the world. Is the world coming after what you're trying to do? Is the world, you know, with the false gods and the false everything and the wickedness that's out there, just coming after you trying to pull? I mean, look, you got to raise strong kids. You got to raise strong kids. You can't have these kids that are just like this all the time. You could create that by being that person, by being that bramble. You could literally create kids that are destroyed by the same type of person that you are, Christian. It's possible. That, I mean, that's the lesson of this curse. Look, this, this question on how to pass this down, on how to take, hey, I figured out, I, look, I'm not perfect, but you know, I, you guys all think, hey, we're good, we're, we're in church on Wednesday night, we're serving the Lord, we're doing the right things, and, and I think I can sustain this through my life. Look, that's great if you figure that out. That's great, but everybody fails at passing it to the next generation. Not everybody, but kings failed. Nations failed. That's why the children of Israel, as soon as he was dead, just like that, false gods, just forgot everything, killed his own children. The man they wanted to be king, the children they wanted to be king, they killed him because they couldn't figure out this secession. It's a, it's, look, it's the problem in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it's the problem. I mean, they, I mean, all the guys, Moses and, and Joshua, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. That's all they said was don't forget the word of the Lord again and again and again and again. And immediately, one generation later, they forgot. So don't ever stop taking this seriously. You have to lead like an olive tree. You have to follow the leadership example of the Bible. You have to be a servant leader in the Bible. You can't be a bramble. You can't raise weaklings because it, it takes strength. And I bet you, I, well, I guarantee you, if you, men and women, adults in this room, if you are the type of people who are going to be in this Christian life 10 years from now, you're a strong person. There's people in this room that won't be in the Christian life in 10 years. But the ones that are are strong people. They're, they're olive trees, and they're vines, and they're fig trees. They're not, and, and they're, they're servants. And I guarantee, look, I, I hope that, that you're all here, but we can't raise weaklings. And we can't, and look, you can't, you will raise weaklings by being the bramble leader. That, that is just my way or the highway. You say, I'm a, that makes me a tough leader. And I'm just, Rah, you know, and this is how. Look, it, the Bible's telling you right here what you'll raise. If you rule people in the shadows and threaten with fire. And we'll see. We'll see how this curse comes literally true in the, in the last half of Judges chapter 9. But there is great leadership lessons for us. And, and everybody's the leader here. Like, I'm not a leader. Yeah, you're a leader. Even the teenagers in this room, you are a leader to the younger kids, to the next generation of children coming up, parents, wives, dads, your leaders. And how you lead matters. And if you say, I want to be in charge because I want to have the preeminence, you better just, you better fix that. Because you're going you're gonna to ruin people's lives. That is Jotham's curse. Let's bow our heads and have a, a word of prayer.